practice exam. You will hear a number of different recordings and will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the questions and instructions and you will have a chance to check your answers. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a customer calling a travel agent to book a holiday. First, you will have some time to look at questions one to three. You will see that there's an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation related to this will be played first. Hello, Travel Wide, can I help you? Oh yes, good morning. I'm looking for a hotel for a long weekend. The caller says that he is looking for a hotel for a long weekend. So the answer is C, a few days. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello, Travel Wide, can I help you? Oh yes, good morning. I'm looking for a hotel for a long weekend. OK. First of all, um, where would you like to stay? I mean, are you looking for a peaceful weekend in the country, a busy city break or a relaxing time at the beach? Well, I certainly want a quiet weekend. I work very hard, so I'd like to relax for a few days. Right, so it would be country or beach. Which would you prefer? Mm, the beach is very relaxing, but... I think I'd rather go to the country this time. OK, that's fine. Let me have a look at country hotels. Would you like to stay at a spa hotel where you could swim, read, eat healthy food and have relaxing treatments? Or would you prefer a family hotel on a farm? Uh, I must say I like the idea of a spa. Well, that's great. Now, let's just look at our spa hotels. Mm, you definitely don't want the beach. No, I'd like to go somewhere in the countryside, somewhere where I can go for walks. OK, then it won't be the Ocean Waves Resort. Farmhouse Getaways is a family-run hotel in the country, but it's not a spa. How does Sparkling Spring sound? It's a luxury spa hotel in the countryside, with an indoor heated pool and views over the fields and woods nearby. That sounds exactly what I'm looking for. Let's go for that. Excellent. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 7. Track 41. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 7. Now, if I can take some details, I can make the booking for you. Could I have your full name, please? Yep. My name's William French. William French. And your address? Number four, The Willows, Stanmarch, Norfolk, NE1, 4SP. The Willows. Sorry, how do you spell that? W-I-L-L-O-W-S. The Willows. Thank you. And can I have a contact number for you? Yes, my mobile's probably the best one. It's 07632 112254. O seven six three two double one double two five O. No, it's O seven six three two double one double two five four. Sorry, five four. And when would you like to go? On the weekend of the fifteenth of June. Fine. Checking in on the fifteenth of June. And when would you like to check out? I'd like to stay until the night of Monday the 18th of June, so I'd be leaving on Tuesday the 19th. Right. Check out on Tuesday the 19th of June. And how will you be paying? By credit card. How much will it be? Ah, uh, let me see. Four nights at £90 per night 
is £360. Is that OK? It includes breakfast and dinner and a treatment a day. Yes, that sounds fine. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Track 42. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Would you like me to tell you how to get to the hotel once you're in the village? It's a bit difficult to find. Oh, yes, please. I have maps on my mobile phone, but there isn't always a signal. OK. Well, coming into the village from the motorway, which is in the east, the first building you see on your right is the church. It's right opposite the garden centre. OK. The church is on my right and the garden centre on my left. Yes. Just after that, you'll come to the railway crossing and then you'll see the river on your left. After that on the right, you'll see the school. It's just before the bridge over the river. So the school's before the bridge? Yes, that's right. Now, just after the bridge, you'll see a turning on your left. Take that and follow the road through the fields. On your left, between the road and the river, you'll see a lot of vegetable gardens. Just keep going down the road to the end. It leads straight into the car park at the spa. You can't miss it. It's at the end of the road. Thank you very much for your help. My pleasure. I hope you have a lovely weekend. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Track. Track 43, Section 2. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Good morning. Welcome to the Science Museum. There's so much to do here. You could spend all day going from one exhibition to another. But if your time is limited, I'd suggest choosing maybe just one main exhibition. At the moment, I suggest that you don't miss our new exhibition of everyday inventions. It's amazing to see how objects we use in our daily lives, like paper clips, tea bags and light bulbs, were invented in the first place and how they've developed over the years into such an essential part of our lives that we hardly ever notice them. You shouldn't miss it. The other thing I'd suggest if you don't have much time is a guided tour of the free exhibitions. These tours usually start on the hour, at one o'clock, two o'clock and so on. They're quite short, only half an hour, so you could do a couple of tours in an afternoon if you wanted to. If you'd like to go on a tour, you should go to the entrance of the exhibition on the ground floor and wait for the guide there. Before you hear the next part of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 17. Track 44. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 17. Just to give you an idea of the range of exhibitions we have here at the museum, I'm going to tell you about the exhibitions and activities we have for visitors of different ages. First of all, for the little ones, we have a fascinating area called Shapes and Patterns, where they can play with objects and images and see how they form different patterns. It's really colourful and exciting. Kids love it. Then, at the other end of the scale, we have more complex exhibitions that appeal more to our older visitors. There's one about the history of aviation, how planes developed over the years. Older visitors may even be able to remember some of the earlier planes on display. Another exhibition that adults might particularly enjoy is the Energy Exhibition. It shows the historical development of different forms of energy in Britain and how it has powered industry over the centuries. And of course, we mustn't forget the teenagers. There are lots of exhibitions to interest them, but my favourite one is the one where visitors can find out more about how physics works. 
It's a fun exhibition with plenty of hands-on activities that explore how light and heat and chemicals work. I still go there myself now and then. It's brilliant. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Track 45. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Most of our exhibitions are free, but you will need a ticket for some of the special ones, like the 3D film shows. So let me explain how you get a ticket online. Of course, you can do this directly at the ticket office, but if there's a long queue, you can book online on your mobile. So, go to our home page and choose the Events button. Then, click on the film title. That'll take you to the next window. In the right-hand corner, you'll see a little calendar. Choose the date on the calendar and then go to the next window. There's a drop-down box there for you to choose the time and another one for the number of tickets. Careful on that page. There are different prices for adults and children. When you've done that, go to the final page and choose your payment method. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Track six, section three. You will hear two students and their tutor discussing a survey project. First, you will have some time to look at questions twenty one to twenty three. Now, listen carefully and answer questions twenty one to twenty three. So, what's the survey about, Tom? It's about where students want to live and how they choose. Basically, their accommodation preferences. We've actually tried it out with a few students already. OK, that sounds fine. So, to start with, how many questions have you got? Hmm, 20? Is that too many? Yes, it is, really. People get fed up answering lots of questions and they stop thinking about their answers. Right, so we need to think about that again. What do you think of the first three questions? Um, uh, you want to know what affects students' choice of accommodation when they go to university? Yes, we want to find out which has the most effect, the cost, the number of rooms in the house or flat, or the distance from campus. And then we asked another question. Oh, yes. What else did you want to find out? Well, we wondered whether public transport was important. You know, not many students have cars, so it might be quite important for them to be near somewhere where they could catch a bus or train. Yeah, that's a good question. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 26. Track 47 now listen and answer questions 24 to 26. Before you ask any more people, I've got a couple of suggestions for improving the questionnaire. First of all, I think you need to ask fewer questions. As I said, 20 is really too many. I'd cut it down to 10 if I were you. OK, 10 questions only. And is there anything else you think we should do? Well, yes. Some of the questions are actually quite complicated. I think you should make them clearer. I mean, I think they should be easier to understand. And what do you think about asking more questions about cost? No, I don't think you need any more about cost. But you could ask a couple more questions about the reasons for students' decisions. So we should ask some more questions with why? Yes, I think you'd get quite a lot more information if you did that. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Track 48. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Um, we've already got some results from our first questionnaire. Do you think we could use them? I don't see why not. What have you found out so far? Well, the number of rooms was only important for 16% of the people we asked. It looks like a lot of students are quite happy to share a room. 
and even fewer people were concerned about being near a bus stop. Only ten percent, in fact. I'm surprised about that. But what about the distance from the university? Well, that was quite important. Around twenty percent of the students we asked wanted to be close to campus. Hmm, that makes sense. And what about the cost? <laughs> yeah, as we expected, the cost was by far the most important factor. More than half the students were concerned with the cost. Fifty-four percent, to be exact. Only fifty-four percent. I thought it would be closer to eighty percent. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Check your answers. Track forty nine, section four. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you will have some time to look at questions thirty one to thirty four. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty one to thirty four. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is. How birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food, and two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact. These reasons are closely linked, as you can imagine. When birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young, and in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young, and then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter. They fly back to warmer climates in the south. Before you hear the next part of the talk, you have some time to look at questions thirty-five to thirty-seven. Track fifty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-five to thirty-seven. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures, but unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young, and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions thirty-eight to forty. Track fifty-one. Now listen and answer questions thirty-eight to forty. Now I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration.、Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies, and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an Arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe, from the North Pole to the South. The Arctic tern travels between twelve and fifteen thousand kilometers each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing, right? And lastly. I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting, and this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, 
like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line as we might think. That is the end of the listening test. You now have some time to check your answers.